One of my favorite kinds of shows to watch after watching a bunch of other things is to watch a show that likes to make fun of itself. When you see constant tropes of various genres used all the time, they start to become tiring and cliche. So to watch a show that recognizes that while also using the exact same tropes is very refreshing. So last season, fall 2015, there was this show called One Punch Man. The general gist of the story is that it is about a superhero that can kill anything in one punch. It, it, it's a very self-explanatory title. But there are two absurd things about this. One, how can you care about a character that is seemingly invulnerable and can defeat any adversary in one punch? Where's the, the build-up? Where's the tension that normally accompanies these big fight scenes? Where are the moments that you were cheering at your screen? You can do it! Never give up! Because None of that happens if the character just throws one punch and it's over. Second absurd thing is just the history of how this show even came to be. Because at one point, it looked like this. Ladies, gentlemen, and others, my name is Arcada and welcome to Glass Reflection. Today, the absurdly popular and the popularly absurd anime from Studio Madhouse, One Punch Man. Let's jam! So I already gave you the in a nutshell version of the plot. One Punch Man is about a guy with the ability to kill anything in one punch. He becomes a superhero and, well, he kills everything in one punch. It's kind of the focus of the whole show, even if it's not the focus of any given episode. The setting of the show is bare bones, with a bunch of nameless cities that only have numerical designations to tell them apart, a government agency that categorizes humans with superpowers, and, you know, mutated beings as well that are constantly coming out of the woodwork, and said mutated beings wreaking havoc only to usually be fought by whatever superhero happens to be in the vicinity. Ignoring the fact that the amount of damage these villains do during any given episode is unsustainable over a long period of time because things get blown up faster than they could possibly rebuild them, much focus is placed on how this government agency, the Hero Association, categorizes the world's heroes by letter and number. Now I know this seems like sidetracking, but bear with me. In One Punch Man, the letter corresponds to the hero's rank, and the number shows where in that ranking the hero fits relative to all the others. Rank C is the lowest, the street crime, the help my kid and get out of a tree kind of hero. And at the end is the S rank, the oh thank god, Superman is here to save the day. The ranking is important to keep in mind, and I bring it up this early because our single punching hero, Saitama, requires it for the audience to actually give a care. See, as I mentioned, Saitama does not have, and by definition, cannot have, the traditional things that a hero normally requires for an audience to be able to empathize with them. No enemy is too threatening. No obstacle is too difficult to overcome. He might as well just be a walking god amongst man, because that's kind of what he is. So why should we care or root for him at all? If all he does is show up and go, la la la, curse splat, with the villain. What you gonna do, brother, when Saitama goes wild on you with these pythons, brother? Thank you, bad Hulk Hogan impression. We care because the world doesn't treat him fairly. His trials and tribulations are not of a typical hero defeating a villain, but of this impossible man being misunderstood by those around him. You remember that ranking system that I mentioned earlier? Well, you would think that a, a, a something this powerful, an ability this absurd, this deus ex machina kind of thing to be able to kill anything in one punch would, would grant Saitama the rank of S, the highest rank. Well, no. When first tested, Saitama is given the rank of C, the lowest available, not because of his physical prowess, but because of a written exam that he just failed horribly on. At no point did anyone even think of making an exception. Think of reworking the test that failed so badly. You have a guy who broke every mechanical machine, smashed every record that they had ever recorded, and they gave that man a C rank. Because they're idiots. But they have to be. We see this injustice and are supposed to act accordingly. Hey, that's not fair, we cry. They did it wrong, we say. The unfairness laid upon Saitama is our reason to care, is our reason to root for him, because without it, he has no challenge. He has to have something that challenges him, that cannot be defeated with a single, well-aimed punch to the face. The association doesn't recognize his power, his colleagues don't give him the time of day, the general public think he's a fake. 
Like, how can a C-class hero be killing things in one hit? He must be just stealing the glory from the other heroes who do all the work, right? I was worried that the show would have nowhere to go but down after the first few episodes, just because of how unrelatable I viewed Saitama as being over time. But thankfully, I was wrong. If you are looking for a more traditional hero story, however, even just to hold it up in contrast to Saitama, then Genos has you covered. Genos is a cyborg with a dark history and a desire to get revenge on another unknown cyborg that killed his family. Despite being a highly skilled fighter and decisively dangerous, he is constantly critical of himself and has the desire to improve. Because even being as powerful as he is, he is still not powerful enough. And after seeing the awesome godlike powers of Saitama firsthand, he more or less begs him to take him on as an apprentice, with the hopes of learning the secret behind his master's awesome power. He is, at least in a traditional hero story, quite honestly the one that would normally be the main character. He's nice, he has a sense of justice, he is extremely powerful, but is constantly pitted against beings and people who have powers slightly higher than him to give him a challenge. And like I mentioned earlier, Genosa provides the contrast of what you would expect Saitama to get, but what he doesn't. The public applauds Genosa for his efforts. The association thinks highly of him and ranks him as such, but he himself knows his limits and knows that if he were ever to fight his master, he would lose. And it wouldn't even be a close battle. They aren't the only good characters though. Like when you're dealing with this superhero series that needs to have a bunch of unique and interesting characters to work with, it's always fun to watch and see what just randomly turns up. It's very Mystery Men-like, or if you want an anime reference, Tiger and Bunny. Moomen Raida is a very good example, the C-rank hero on a bike that doesn't have a motorcycle license. He is a hero for the common man, someone without notable superhuman strength or ability, but one with the bravery to never back down from a fight or overlook any crime. Or, moving much higher up the scale, is the Tornado of Terror, Tatsumaki. A powerful psychic who's going for that wicked witch of the west look, and has the ability to crush you beneath an entire city. It's not even scratching the surface on the characters though, as each individual villain is compelling in their own right, despite how quickly that most of them are defeated. And lastly, of course, there is the greatest character of all, the most powerful being in the entire series, a being so powerful that not even Saitama could kill it in one punch. The Fly. What I actually found to be one of the most compelling reasons to watch this show, besides that clip of the fly that I just showed you, is just the amount of planetary alignment on the solstice every thousand years kind of luck that had to happen in order for the show to be produced in the first place. Because this is where it all started. One Punch Man originated as a poorly drawn webcomic started in 2009 by the webcomic artist One. Later, in 2012, as a collaboration with illustrator Yusuke Murata after the immense popularity of the webcomic, the story was re-released in manga format in Weekly Young Jung featuring the same story but with Murata's much higher quality illustrations. And after that sold several million copies, did Madhouse step in to help create this visual spectacle that we can enjoy today. It's a bit meta when you think about it. This story about superheroes overcoming a variety of great obstacles itself had to overcome a variety of obstacles to get where it is now. It shows that any artist with the desire to draw can one day, potentially, have an anime series made about their work. Even if that's highly unlikely, even for the most popular of webcomics. Like, do you see Homestuck getting an anime adaptation? Like, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't read Homestuck. Now, for the animation itself, well, actually, I should bring up a bit of terminology that I've never bothered to use before. So let's let, let's step back for a moment and talk a bit about Sakuga. This is actually a rather detailed and involved topic that I don't have enough time to, you know, 100% fully explain. And while I do not claim to be an expert on this subject, I thought it would be a good time to briefly go over the term and its general meaning for those who have never heard of it before. While the term Sakuga can be literally translated into drawing pictures or drawing animation, it has more recently been used as a kind of slang term for a particular kind of animation. Specifically animation that is really really good. Within any anime, Sakuga is identifiable by those moments where the fluidity and general movement or just 
simply the quality of the animation is heavily increased in comparison to the rest of the show. It's those times where everything is in motion, things explode, characters are backflipping left and right, and rather than just having two or three keyframes in the animation to show this, there are many, many more than that. Although Sakuga also isn't inherently action scenes either, as you can still have the same amount of fluidity that can happen in more subtle scenes as well, adding to the emotion of the scene. This is all an oversimplification, of course, but that's the general idea. Like, you may recall sometimes in the past when I have used my very little amount of industry knowledge to talk about animation budgets, specifically how, in general, anime films are able to accomplish so much more just because of how much extra funding they receive. This extra funding allows them to have much longer scenes done as Sakuga, and sometimes, depending on the studio, almost entire films are done this way. Of course, it's also worth mentioning that a high budget does not equal higher quality animation, but often, skilled key animators are more expensive to hire, and having a higher budget certainly helps. Since Sakuka can be quite a bit more intensive, both from an artistic perspective for the key animator and from a monetary perspective from the studio, it's usually reserved for key climactic moments or scenes that are reusable. There's lots of motion, movement, and very little in the way of static characters with mouth flap only that is stereotypically used in anime to cut costs. So if you're interested on this topic at all, I'll put some links in the description where you can go and research it on your own because this is just a very general overview. But anyway, why is this important for something like One Punch Man? Well, quite simply, from last season, One Punch Man was more or less Sakuga the anime. This is probably more noticeable due to the differing styles at work, like when the art is trying to reference the original art style that one used back in the webcomic, there is absolutely no Sakuga to be had. But it's that flip between the very two-dimensional webcomic art and the more highly detailed fights that make the Sakuga used all the more noticeable. Needless to say, I hope the amount of pure awesome that I've shown here in some footage gets across just how great One Punch Man is. And from what I understand, it had a fairly average budget for what Madhouse normally does, so if that proves to be true, it's even more impressive. Oh, and uh, you may recall, back a little while ago in my Hunter x Hunter review, I was hemming and humming about Madhouse. Well, uh, yeah, I take that all back, because at this moment, Madhouse is awesome. Period. None of this only when they work on films bullshit that I've talked about before. No, 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 no none of that. Their stuff is really great, they know what they're doing, and I really do look forward to whatever they're planning on producing in the near future. Now, the soundtrack has this feeling of inspiration behind it. Not in the way that it took a lot of inspiration to make, which might well be the case, but rather that the music does its best to inspire you. The fast-paced action guitar makes you want to punch something square in the face, and the slower tracks will help you push through those tough times. Like when you're trying to write a review script on One Punch Man. The music fits every situation that it accompanies, and if I thought that I had the physical prowess to do so, I would listen to the soundtrack while doing 100 sit-ups, 100 push-ups, and 100 squats every single day. The opening track to the series is also one big explosion of hype. Like, here's a show about this badass, come watch. It reminds me a lot of the opening for Trigun, if the opening for Trigun had been doing nothing but lifting since the 90s and is now jacked as hell. Like, just, just, just listen to this hype, man. Just, just listen. So good. To me, One Punch Man isn't impressive because it does anything completely unique from the norm, but rather it's impressive because it takes what we expect from the norm and flips it on its head. In popular media, superhero stories are a dime a dozen nowadays, and this series both celebrates that while at the same time making a parody of it. And at no point does the series try to be funny either, it just is. From the nonchalant way that Saitama acts to the Dragon Ball Z homages of powerful muscular characters to, to even the futility of lesser heroes, the show isn't trying to be funny, but the simple absurdity of the situations makes it so. It is a highly entertaining series, one that is beautifully animated, well thought out, and came from what I can only describe as more or less nothing. As I doubt many people would have guessed that when the webcomic artist One started this thing, that it would become, well, this. I know a lot of people are clamoring for a second season. I would be one of them. There's still a lot of the story from the series that was left unexplained. Genos' backstory, for one, is of particular note here, but there is also the motivations behind some of the more lesser expanded upon heroes. So a second season would do wonders for all of that. But if we don't get it, 
Like, if it takes too long from when the manga, or rather the webcomic, continues, then gets translated into the manga, and then potentially could become another season of anime, if that takes far too long, and they don't make it, you know what? I would be fine with that, because what we got was just great. And so, with all that in mind, I present One Punch Man with the rating of Certified Frosty. A rating for only the best of the best, and those shows too important to be ignored. While it wasn't my pick for best anime of last year, shout out to Shiro Bako, it does things in its own particular way that I found immensely entertaining, and it was definitely one of the highlights of 2015. So if you haven't got around to watching it yet, well, yeah, yeah, get on that. At the time of this video, One Punch Man has been licensed by Viz Media with, I hope, a home video release forthcoming. And this is the part of the video where I show my discontent at Viz Media for not releasing a full version of Monster out onto the world. And the moment's done. Until they hopefully do actually release One Punch Man on home video, the series is legally available for streaming, in North America at least, over on Dicekey.net, a website that up until this point I had actually yet to use, but since have had absolutely no problems with it. So with any luck, it'll actually turn into a good competitor to the already existing legal anime streaming websites that exist on the market. Link in the description for that. Now, for alternate anime recommendations, I first point you towards another series that has superheroes aplenty, that being Tiger and Bunny. How the heroes are presented is quite different from how One Punch Man does it, and Tiger and Bunny focuses much more with a celebrity and advertising mindset that One Punch Man only briefly touches on. The second recommendation I have for you is a blind one, though it's one I hope to watch in the very near future myself, and that is Gintama. From what I understand, the main characters of both Gintama and One Punch Man are quite similar, though Gintama is a series that has a much more comedic bend to it. It's a series that has been recommended to me by so many numerous people that I have zero qualms with listing it here. So between those two, you should hopefully find something to your liking. And that's it for me. Please subscribe if you enjoy the video, follow me on Twitter if you feel so inclined, and hey, if you like what I do here and feel like helping out, please consider going and checking out my Patreon page, and if you feel it within your heart, also consider donating. Very special thanks to Joshua Garcia, Nikolai Gray, Grace Anderson, Lulika Adachi, Victor Ekmark, and Alex Shaw for donating already. You guys are all seriously amazing, and I thank you. And until next time, ladies, gentlemen, and others, stay frosty. Wow!